So uh, my objective is to um, just go over, over uh, the definition of ARS, the new definition, and uh, our standard therapy from the ARSNET trials, and talk about the fracture hypoxemia and how we utilize rescue therapy. <coughs> and this is what you'll be doing. And some of you have seen this with us in the ICU, what we do for the patient with uh, severe ARS. Um, I don't know go over the evidence behind what we do that. This is all definition of arts, um, acute respiratory distress, uh, bilateral infiltrate, um, no evidence of atrial hypertension, so there's not a cardiac etiology for that, and the PF ratio was less than 300. And then the new one, basically the same definition as far as the timing, it's an acute process, Within one week of insults, uh, the, the infiltrate on the x-ray is bilateral infiltrate, and it also has, you have to exclude uh, cardiac etiology from this uh, uh, bilateral infiltrate. And then they divide it into mild, moderate, and severe, which is the new thing, for mild arts, 200 to 300 TFH, moderate, 100 to 200, and severe less than 100. And we're going to start with the first question. Uh, so we have 45 years old patient uh, with uh, massive aspirations, developed cause, transfer to ICU placed on 12 ml, uh, final volume, uh, respiratory 12, feet 8, FI 40, plateau was 36, and then you elected to follow ours, so you dropped final volume to 6, and according to the, the trials, the ARTS trial, these changes for the first uh, two to three days likely to lead to which would fall. <clears throat> Improve lung compliance and oxygenation, worsening lung compliance and oxygenation, improve lung compliance, no effect on oxygenation, or no effect on compliance and oxygenation. Yes. B. B. I'm sorry? B. 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 Yeah. So when you're going to drop the tile volume, of course, mm. your uh, yeah. compliance uh, and the oxygen is going to get worse. Uh, that's the expected um, when you uh, follow the arts protocol. And this is the trial um, in 2011 uh, uh, article. So you have the 12 conventional, 12 ml conventional group, and you have the 6 ml, which is the low volume group, and mortality and um, Morbidity as well as all uh, is better in the uh, low battle volume, and that's what we've been using. So the mortality dropped from 40 to 30. Uh, see here, and uh, that's what we use, um, and it's basically reported in the capital marker. So let's see the second question uh, again, talking about uh, standard therapy for ox. So. Uh, <coughs> First, we use a small tidal volume. This is another question that address another uh, standard care. 56 years old male intubated on mechanical ventilation for arts, uh, blood pressure 130 or 80, pulse 86, urine output is 0.8. According to ArtsNet, the best fluid management and best method of monitoring is, and you have conservative fluid and monitoring device is equivalent. Conservative fluid monitoring uh, you need to monitor with only RT catheter. You need to have liberal fluid, monitoring device equivalent, meaning that the central line versus this one, the central line versus um, swan, the same. Or you need to use liberal fluid and use a monitoring device with swan. So which one, according to this, again, the second R's that's called the FACT trial, which one is the uh, standard camera? One. So conservative and monitoring device is equivalent. This is, what, uh, this is what the study is. It's called the FACT trial. It's large. Uh, again, it's a uh, net trial, prospective randomized trial, about 1,000 patients. And they uh, looked at the conservative management versus liberal management. And they looked at the central line versus the uh, swan. And again, mortality didn't really change, but the ventilation days was different. The conservative was uh, better, of course, in the ventilation days, ICU days are all the same. And you look at the organ failure score, uh, or organ failure, we call organ failure three days, there is really no difference. Uh, 
people concerned about the conservative group will have higher uh, incidence of organ failure than it looks like for the cardiovascular, even renal. Uh, you can see here there is really no difference. So the organ failure is no different, but uh, patient gets off the vent and uh, ICU sooner. So that's what we use, conservative management now. You be careful that uh, you only use this in patients who are thermodynamically stable. So in the fact trial, A1 in shock was excluded, A1 was holoduria was excluded, anyone was uh, circulatory compromised was excluded. So the idea is that this hemodynamic takes precedence and you have to make sure that the patient, if the patient is hypotensive with arts, you don't worry too much about the conservative management, you need to uh, give them fluid if needed. So that's the uh, uh, thing that you keep in mind. And uh, from this uh, FACTS trial, um, we looked at the subset of the patient that they received the SWAN, and the uh, SWAN didn't really have any um, uh, change on the survival organ uh, function or uh, didn't have any impact on ventilations or ICU days for that reason. Um, there is no evidence to support routine use of pulmonary artery catheter, so we don't need to use it anymore for this particular patient's population. So just to summarize uh, the earlier trials and what we uh, do for the uh, uh, standard therapy for ours, you have this mobile volume, <coughs> you uh, keep the control pressure less than 30, and you're using a modest peep, which we're going to discuss, and you use a conservative fluid management. This is basically what, uh, what we have. Um, why it's important to um, um, look at the patient with ours and see their um, severity of ours uh, because it affects their uh, prognosis and outcomes of so the patient improves um, in the first 24 hour the mortality is really low but if the patient didn't improve uh, their mortality can get up to 50 60 percent especially with severe ARPS. Um, where this came from um, there's a, a very nice study uh, done by Wheeler that looked at the combination of PFIA2, which one that will differentiate between one injury and severity of ARDS. And so they have four categories of patients. They have 100% FIA2, 10 of PEEP, 100% 5 of PEEP, 50% 5 of PEEP, and 50% 10 of PEEP. And they looked at the outcome for these patients, looked at the blood gas and the regression analysis, and they figured out that the combination of 10 of PEEP and FIA2, 50%, best identifies the subcategories of these patient laws. And they recommended that for you, as a treating physician, when you get a patient uh, and you want to try to figure out exactly uh, these patients are lung injury only versus uh, moderate or severe odds, you need to put them at least on a 10 of the 50% of five two and get a clear ratio and then you can figure out exactly where are they falling and then you can determine if you are going to be using any of the rescue therapy. And um, just to remind you, um, after you do all this and you assist the patient in the first day and you do your uh, FDF ratio and so on, uh, you're going to be familiar with the term of refractory hypoxemia, severe arts. Um, these are a group of patients that have a PF ratio less than 100. Um, or you are unable to maintain a low plateau pressure despite using a very low time of volume, or the patient have high oxygenation index and the formula to calculate the oxygenation index is in, uh, FIO2 times the mean airway pressure times 100 divided by FIO2. Uh, uh, or if the patient develop paratrauma as a sign of lung injury, that's also uh, one of the uh, diagnostic uh, criteria for refractory hypoxemia. Another term that you need to be familiar with, patients with uh, high ventilator requirements. These are people more than 70, uh, FI2, 15 of PEEP, and also have high plateau pressure with low tidal volume. These are also considered to be um, severe arts, high ventilator requirements, um, refractory hypoxemia. These are the ones that you really need to uh, look after. Uh, try to figure out this group of patients in the first 24, 48 hours um, so you can uh, determine which rescue therapy you are going to use. So don't wait too much. First day or two, try to figure out exactly 
where the patient is heading. They're seeing they're improving, the mortality is good, and they're getting worse over the same kind of mortality is in the 50-60%. So I'm, before I address some of these rescue therapy, these are some of the guidelines. Uh, you use it for a patient with severe ARS, refractory hypoxemia. Uh, there are ventilatory measures, there are non-ventilatory measures. We're gonna touch some of each, both of them. Um, the choice is really should be based on your expertise and, and the evidence in the literature which I'm going to discuss, and also the availability of equipment and some of the rescue therapy, like ECMO is not gonna be available everywhere. And then if you're gonna be trying rescue therapy, make sure you have an exit strategy, so if it works, you are going to continue, and if it doesn't work, then you're gonna to have to stop. You don't wanna continue ECMO, for example, for a month or six weeks, just because you have the ability to do and the patient is not getting better. Um, so you're gonna to have to have a way of uh, stopping. Um, so these are the list of the uh, ventilatory, non-ventilatory um, strategies that uh, has some evidence in the literature which I'm going to address today. We have the PEEP, the recruitment, transpulmonary uh, uh, pressure targeted ventilation, like using the balloon, or severe balloon, uh, prone position, neuromuscular blocker, ECMO, nitric, and high frequency. So first the PEEP, and we're gonna start with a question. So you have 58 uh, years old with ARDS on mechanical ventilation that our volume is 6 ml as recommended, and by 270, PEEP 5, blood gas is acceptable if this petrol pressure is 25. In an effort to reduce the FIA2, we went up on the PEEP to 12, and this results in the introduction of the FIA2. Based on the large randomized trial, this change will also reduce the um, Plateau pressure, improve mortality, decrease plateau pressure, more effective mortality, increase plateau pressure, improve mortality, increase plateau pressure, more effective mortality. So when you increase the people, what happens? I'm sorry? Increase the plateau. Increase plateau and no effective mortality. So that's basically what it is. Uh, um, and this is based on these uh, large randomized trials. So this is ARDS net trial, it's called the Alveoli trial. So it's another arm of the ARDS net. So we talked about the first one and the fact, and this is the third one. And then you have two trials that were also published after this one. So this is 2004, this is 2008. You have the express trial and love trial. Uh, all of them looked at low versus by tidal volume, and if you look at the protocol, this is a very busy slide, but I'll walk you through it. You have a control group that has a low tidal volume and low peep um, range of 18 to about 10 to 11, and you have the high peep, which is uh, 11 to about 15 or 16. And the three groups are the same, or three trials are the same. And they looked at the outcome, and all the three trials have shown improvement in oxygenation of the PF ratio is improving with the higher peep. So all of them had the same results, okay? None of them had any survival advantage, that's why we say there's no mortality benefit, but there is improvement of oxygenation. And then if you look at the two um, uh, Canadian trial, the Express and Love, um, the uh, refractory hypoxemia and death from refractory hypoxemia were less than the high peep. Um, and that's what we recommend for these patients is to use the high peep rather than the low peep. Uh, you're going to need to know if your patient is uh, going to benefit from the PEEP or high PEEP, so we uh, recommend something called recruitment maneuver, uh, which we'll discuss a little bit. And then, um, I'm sorry. So you can start with a, a low PEEP and you keep going up on the PEEP, or you can start at a high PEEP and you go down until you have deoxygenation and then you stop. So you can do an incremental or decremental PEEP increase. We usually start with this one, the incremental will go up. Uh, but the recruitment is different. I'm gonna exp explain it to you. You can do a recruitment maneuver with a PEEP, or you can do it a recruitment maneuver with a PEEP and pressure support, the pressure control. Uh, the idea is that you go on up in the PEEP to about 30 or 40, or about 20 to 40 seconds, and then you drop them down to the high PEEP range, not to normal. Uh, 
Uh, and if you're using the combination of PEEP and uh, pressure control, you do a pressure control when you're 15 or 20, and you do a 25 or 20 of PEEP for another, also again, 30, 40 seconds, and then you drop them down. So that's basically what you do to recruit. And if you see an improvement of oxygenation, so you drop them to the high PEEP and you leave them. So you can do that. Most patients with uh, severe ARS are going to be requiring um, PEEP in the range of 8 to 15. I would recommend that you choose the 11 to 15 or 16 range, which is the higher uh, PEEP, which will help uh, uh, the uh, uh, patient with severe ARS. Um, so the recruitment, um, let's talk about this. Uh, there's a question here. Um, morbidly obese, BMI of 53 on event and has uh, severe R's. Uh, vent setting tidal volume is 530. That's 8 ml for ideal body weight. And 100% of I2 people 12. And then if it was 52, CO2 is 64, pH 718. It's plateau pressure measured at 38. <coughs> and which adjustment to the vent should you, should you do to address the hypoxemia and maintain the lung protections? Um, so you have an option of increasing PEEP, accept higher plateau, increasing PEEP, reduce tidal volume, increase tidal volume, reduce PEEP. And then you reduce our volume and the so, so, so the answer is one. Um, and the reason for this is that this patient is obese and this plateau pressure is probably not reflective of his transpulmonary pressure. Uh, this is just because of his mobile obesity, his plateau pressure is high, and that's why uh, we are, are going to be talking about um, not only the line recruitment, but we'll talk about the. Um, sorry. Why wouldn't you just use six cc's? Why I'm sorry? Why wouldn't you use six cc's? Again, so the time of volume I will use for this patient is going to be based on the transpulmonary pressure. So you keep this in the respiratory transpulmonary pressure below 25. Um, so yes, uh, you want to use six ml per kilogram ideal body weight. But the idea of using six, six ml is to maintain this plateau pressure. Mm -hmm. And since in this patient this plateau pressure is not accurate, I would use the transformatory pressure to guide your final volume and guide your peak. But you don't have that. Not everywhere has those. Well. I think. No, that's true. I mean, but it's available everywhere now. It's this transformatory pressure. It's it's available everywhere. It should be. Dr. Sock, for that patient too, in that example, this patient is already like seven one. Seven one. Yes. All right. Um, I sometimes go about the sex if the transformatory pressure is is low. I mean, this is going to be my yeah. analysis. Yeah, but if, in that question, you don't know what the pulmonary pressure is. You should show that the tidal is high, and they're not using. Yeah, I mean, CCC. yes. I think for him, because he's also hypoxic with a PO2 of 50, 50 50 something, and he's on people 12. And the question is, if you want to be improving his oxygenation, what are you going to do? Uh, it's already 100 percent if I do. So you're going to go up on the peak because you know you're going to go up on the peak. The low pressure is going to go high. Yeah. So um, and the question is addressing the thing that this high plateau pressure is probably not reflective of this. So again, the lung recruitment. Um, I talked about it. I said you can use your peak 30 to 50 uh, centimeter water in 20 second, 40 second. You can use combination of peak of pressure control. And the recruitment maneuver was looked at several trials, all of them showing improved oxygenation. This is just an example of, of, of some of these um, evidence. You can see here prior to uh, recruitment and after recruitment, your PF ratio improves. Um, so there is an improvement of oxygenation, but you have to be aware of the complications. You can get hypotension. This is 12 percent. Some of the studies reported 12 percent incidence of hypotension, 8 percent you can get desaturations, and you can have 1% uh, arrhythmias and 1% uh, um, So that's some of the uh, potential complications with lung uh, um, you don't need to, you, know, you don't need to use it routinely. You just use it as a rescue uh, to get the oxygenation up, and then you put it on high beat. 
Um, you don't want to use it in patients with hemodynamic compromise because it does get worse. Or your patient is severe, maybe emphysema, and you worry about chlorothermite, you don't want to use that as well. Um, and then the transpulmonary, this is the, what the question was referring to. Um, so this interest started uh, in about uh, more than 10 years ago. Talmor is, uh, is in Beth Israel in Austin, and he started interest in this, and I published in 2006, uh, that the patient was a uh, different level of Rs, varied greatly in the transpulmonary pressure measurements, and then he uh, started this uh, randomized trial in 2008, it's called EP Vent trial, uh, which has to have to stop after 60 patients. So they're supposed to recruit 150 <coughs> patients and then they stopped after 60, uh, 61 patients because of marked improvement of oxygenations in the patient that receiving this GL pressure um, versus the conventional therapy. Um, so they have to stop and the uh, mean increase in the PF ratio in this GL uh, pressure group was 88 millimeter mercury. So, uh, so they had to stop this and uh, uh, reported it. And now they are actually doing EP Vent 2 trial, which started in 2012, already en enrolled 200 patients, moderate to severe odds by definition, less than 150 PF ratio. This uh, protocol, I'm giving you the protocol, less than 150, they enrolled 200 patients. And they're supposed to uh, complete uh, they need another 20, so they're supposed to be completing, if you look at the uh, uh, clinicaltrial.gov, they said that it's supposed to complete in September of this year. So um, they want to, hopefully they're not going to stop, I and mean, they haven't stopped the trial this time, so they are going to report the benefit of using as a real one driven um, ventilation versus conventional therapy. So looking at the EPVent1 trial, you can see the um, trend. There is a trend, not, not statistically, but there is a trend. Remember, we stopped at 61 patients. Uh, there are trends of mortality benefit. ICU and safe stay was, was better, and ventilation days were better. But of course, the number of patients was limited. That's why you can really have statistical significance, but, but at least there is a trend there. Um, so as I said, the EPVent trial, um, is underway um, and they're going to complete it in September this year. Um, cloning um, has a lot of interest for years, um, starting from early in the 70s. And most of these trials that were done on the prone position, all of them showed the prone oxygenation that was different. Uh, variation in the protocol, some of them use pony for six hours, eight hours, ten hours, um, you know, different things. And this is one of the earlier trials by getting on E and um, that's looked at 304 patients, did pony for six hours, for ten days, but they used high data volume at that time, the, the low data volume is not there. And advantage of the survival, uh, but there's some improvement of oxygenation. So that's basically some of these reports from the prone position. And another trial, <coughs> um, 2004 to 2008, they're all uh, the same uh, improved oxygenation results, no mortality, so it's the same, same concept. Um, and then another one in 2009, which is this one, published in JAMA. They um, did it for a longer period of time, 20 hours, again showed um, in, uh, oxygenation improvement, but no more calories. Um, so these are the reports of this 2009 trial. And you can see here, <coughs> there is really no, uh, there is a difference in the uh, uh, need for sedation between, of course, the uh, pointing and non pointing. Uh, also, vomiting was more and arrhythmia. So there are some complications that was reported, which is expected in the patient on received home position. Now, the final thing that came out in uh, 2013 uh, about the home position, uh, French group. Um, so this is uh, the most recent one. And we have 400 some patients, um, moderate severe Rs. Um, they did it early 
uh, voting within 36 hours. And they continued the voting for 16 hours. So remember when they started, they had like six hours, eight hours, 10 hours. So they were experimenting with the duration. And uh, again, you know, this trial was uh, started within three days. Now this is 36 hours to so shorter. You start early and you do it longer. That's the, that's the key here. You start early, do it for an extended period of time. And in this particular protocol has resulted into mortality benefit and, and also ventilation days and uh, was better. Now the thing about this that uh, was striking is that there is no difference between both groups when it comes to complications. Now, you have to understand that the uh, trial was done in a center that having, had experience with, act, with uh, prone positioning for over five years. And this is a key for minimizing complications. So all these centers that was participated into this trial has been uh, doing pointing and we have experience with it for at least five years. So you cannot say that if I do pointing in another institution, then you're not gonna get, uh, you're not gonna get complications, you're probably gonna get complications, but uh, you're probably gonna have the same results when it comes to uh, mortality and oxygenation. So if you know how to do it, and there is a video on this uh, particular uh, neurodermal issue, there is a video of how you do it, and nurses education actually uh, Jewish downloaded this video and they were doing education for the nurses uh, in anticipation of hopefully trying to do this at some point. Um, but there's a video that educate the, uh, the nurses of how to, to do it. And this is basically the summary of the results. Again, mortality was good in the, uh, in the uh, 28 days, free day, uh, ventilation days, and it was also better. And, uh, and you can see here uh, the uh, curve. So that's the most recent, and um, you know, if you have the ability to do that, you can use it as one of your methods of uh, rescue therapy. And then neuromuscular blocker. <coughs> And the idea about neuromuscular blocker is that you're trying to um, decrease the work of breathing, so you decrease the oxygen consumption. Um, that's the one one um, positive thing from from the paralysis, um, and also improve the ventilation synchrony. That's another you know, advantage. Um, there's earlier a trial done. Uh, 14 years ago, um, looked at the uh, neuromuscular blocker, but didn't show any mortality. There's, again, improved oxygenation, but no mortality. And then there was a concern of an earlier trial about myopathy and increased paralysis and polyneuropathy. So I've been concerned about it. And you can see from this earlier trial, oxygenation improvement uh, with the paralytics is there. Uh, until recently, uh, again, this is 2010. French group also, excuse me, uh, studied the uh, neuromuscular blocker for 48 hours. So they were paralyzed the patient for 48 hours. Again, these are all moderate to severe um, versus control group. Both groups had the same protective lung strategies, smaller volume. Um, there was no difference in ICU weakness. They measure the muscle weakness, uh, muscle weakness and both groups, there was no difference. Again, you only use it for two days. But they showed improvement in mortality and improvement in ventilation three days. So that's another protocol that you can implement is to paralyze the patient for two days and, and take over the ventilation for them. And, uh, that should help uh, in the outcome. Um, and that. Again, you can see up here the uh, mortality and paratrauma is the same, and ventilation days are less. Um, ECMO, um, again, earlier trial in the 70s was really had a bad survival. Survival was only 10%. So this is a very old trial from 79, both of these patients with the uh, hearts. Um, and recent, uh, this is again one of the early 
the trials, um, not earlier, but this is the Caesar trial actually, um, from uh, England. They looked at ECMO versus conventional therapy. Um, we're going to talk about this a little bit. Um, 180 patients. We will have a referral center that the patient will come to uh, for ECMO. Um, the problem with this trial is that the uh, control group did not get the same lung protective strategy, so there is only 70% compliance with the lung protecting strategy in the control group versus 93% in the ECMO group. So there's variations between both groups when it comes to implementing the standard of care, and so that's not good. However, this trial showed survival advantage of ECMO, 63 versus 47. The criticism, of course, is the disparity between the both group. They didn't really get the same uh, lung protective strategy, and that's why people will criticize this article saying that uh, the benefit or the mortality benefit of the ECMO is most likely related to uh, using lung protective strategy, right? For that reason, um, now they are doing this uh, trial, the Uruguaya trial. It's actually completed just four months ago, and they're analyzing the data. Um, so this trial is exactly similar to the CESAR trial. However, <coughs> both groups received exactly the same protocol uh, when it comes to lung protective strategy, okay? So we're gonna find out if this ECMO from this trial is gonna be positive or not. I think if it comes back positive, people are gonna be maintaining interest in it, but if it comes back negative, like what happened with the high frequency oscillation, I think it's gonna kill it. But I wanna go over uh, some of the reports, from the positive reports from ECMO. I wanna remind you about the uh, H1N1 in 2009 and 10. A lot of um, uh, uh, publication came out from a New Zealand group, from German group, looking at their own patient population that had H1N1 acute lung injury and the outcome from the ECMO. All of them have reported fantastic results. You have 71 survival in one report, 55 in another report, 46 in the third. But if you look at the patient population, you find that they're all young, none, uh, not, not sick, they're all young, no comorbidity, and they all have H1N1 acute lung injuries, so when they put them on the ECMO, they all survived or had a very good survival. Now, you cannot really use the same uh, number here for 70 years old, patient with heart failure, maybe COPD, and, and so on. So, so, but these are the reports from a healthy uh, patient during this uh, H1N1. So we're going to need to wait and see what the result of this, as I said, you know, just recently completed. Um, but again, uh, ECMO is not available everywhere. It is expensive. Um, it has complications. Patients are bleeding. Um, they have to be paralyzed. And, you know, there's just uh, so many, uh, so many things that happen with dead infection, of course, and other things. So. You know, if you're going to be using it, you're going to need to know when to use it, what are the ideal patients, and uh, let's see if we can get some results from this uh, trial. Nitric, uh, because it has been uh, used as a risk therapy, and um, the evidence is not that strong, so these are multiple trials from the 80s, 90s. Um, they all looked at uh, nitric versus uh, uh, placebo, of course, and, um, all of them showed oxygenation improvement, but no survival advantage. Um, so you can see one of them here, no mortality benefit. Uh, and you can see even uh, the report of oxygenation uh, improvement is, is limited to the first two days. So one, when you start using the nitric, you can see that in the first 48 hours, you can see the split between both groups. You know, the PF ratio is much better for the first two days, and then, by day three, four, five, they're overlapping. So you can see that you know you lose you lose this advantage after the first two days. So 
uh, it's expensive therapy, no mortality, short-lived uh, improvement oxygenation. That's what you get with the What do you think of that dose they use? They look five, five and ten actually even, but not the twenty. You know, the, the, um, the, yeah, but that doesn't. You know, I, I think there is also reports of using twenty. There is no difference between twenty and ten. Um, using twenty parts is not different. Ten is not different. I don't think that. Um, I don't think it really matters how much you're going to be using them. Cardiology, not cardio, yeah, car cardiothoracic. Sometimes they're using forty. Yeah, they use forty instead. Yeah. yeah. I don't see any advantage of that. There is no evidence that this 40, and there is nothing in the literature that says 40 is better, mm -hmm. uh, but I know that 5 and 10 and 20 is a equal difference. So, uh, high frequency, this is the, uh, used to be popular in the past, and the idea is that you want to deliver small dial volume, rapid rate, uh, to, to maximize mean airway pressure to improve oxygenation and at the same time you decrease <coughs> lung injury. Uh, several trials were done that showed improved oxygenation, no mortality until we had two of these large trials <coughs> and oscillate. Both of them were published around the same time, uh, about five years ago, four years ago. Um, both of them showed actually, one of them showed, Oscar showed no, um, no improvement. Um, in oxygenation, so survival, um, and the oscillate shows worsening, worsening mortality. So oscillate had to be stopped uh, because of the mortality that was high in the uh, in the in the treatment group. Uh, so <coughs> this basically, these two trials killed the high frequencies, or nobody use it. I think there's still need. Uh, of high frequency in, in kids, because I think the evidence in kids is still there. So I think they're still using it, but I think for adults, it's very much end, end the use of high frequency. Um, now, one other thing that you need to um, to know about why the oscillite had higher mortality in the treatment group, we used high P in the control group in the oscillate versus the Oscar. So the Oscar, the control, the treatment group, I mean the control group had a peep of 10. And the oscillate, they use a peep of 15. <coughs> so you can see the difference between 10 and 13. So both protocols are identical, except you use a little bit of higher peep in the oscillate in the control group. And people who reviewed this article, they said that the difference in the outcome is related to the higher P. Uh, you use a higher P, so you had a better outcome in the control, and for that reason, the mortality was higher in the treatment group. That's basically the only difference between Oscar and Oscillate. The, uh, the peak was a little bit higher. Other than that, everything was identical. The patient population was identical. Um, and that's basically killed the high frequency and nobody is thinking about it anymore. So in conclusion, um, the mortality of the arts um, improved with the, of course, uh, low tidal volume, the uh, cons conservative fluid management, and so on. Um, these are all improved, the uh, mortality from arts. Um, the refractory hypoxemia, uh, identification is very important. You have to do this early in the first 24 to 48 hours. The strongest evidence for mortality benefit out of this rescue therapy that I showed you is for high peak and early neuromuscular blockade for 48 hours, early prolonged pointing. So you use 16 hours, <coughs> you do it in the first 36 hours. These are the highest evidence and these are the ones that showed mortality benefit. ECMO, um, we have to wait on the new trial because the CSER trial was uh, has a disparity between both groups as far as the uh, conventional therapy. <coughs> so GL manometry, um, there's no survival advantage but there is an oxygenation improvement and uh, we're going to need to see the second phase of that <coughs> to see if there's any mortality benefit but I think you can use it uh, to guide you for improved oxygenation. Uh, no evidence for nitric and no evidence for high frequency oscillation. That's been, uh, I think, put to rest. I don't really use it anymore. <coughs> so these are the 
three maneuvers that you can do and has highest evidence and then you can consider Passenger manometry. Consider the ECMO, in my opinion, for uh, young um, patients with no comorbidity, I think we will benefit until we get the results from, from this trial. And that's what I have. Questions?